So thank you so much for, for inviting me to talk to you all. Like you're the reason that metabolists exist. And that sounds crazy, um, but it's, it's entirely true. And I'm gonna see if I can change slides. Okay, um, I'm one of the PIs for the HCU uh, Natural History Study by Trevere at our site. And I have no other declarations on this side of the wall. I have declarations that get to go on the other side. Um, so it's interesting because I wasn't gonna start my talk about talk with this, but about two weeks ago, we, I do continuity clinic, and continuity clinic is the opportunity for the genetic residents and metabolic fellows to see their own patients uh, as part of their training. And they have an attending geneticist or metabolist that basically is their supervisor. And um, these are folks in our continuity clinic. They're very, very good. And we share our, we share our residents and our fellows with NIH and we share them with Hopkins, and we have our, some that we train ourselves, and it, it's a conglomeration of individuals. And so in this clinic, I had a third year PEDS genetic resident. I had a, somebody that was graduating from genetics from a PEDS genetic residency. I had two folks who were finishing their first year in their genetics residency, and I had someone who had done three years of pediatrics and two years of genetics, who was getting ready to graduate as well. And I'm setting this up to say, these are folks that I was kind of surprised, but they had a hard time telling the difference between all the different homocystinurias. And these are folks that like, we've been training. They kind of know what they're looking for, but you're like, okay, so what do you expect to see here with this? And for them, I ended up drawing out a picture. So sure, up, sure enough, there's this list of initials and who's seeing whom and what rooms. And underneath it is one of the figures that we're gonna see. So if you think it's confusing to keep track of the homocystinurias and the fact that they all have slightly different therapies, remember, it's incredibly confusing for people who don't do it every day. And it's still confusing for some of our trainees. And so one of the things I ask you is please, please, please tell people not that you have homocystinuria only, tell them the exact name of your disorder. Um, and that sounds kind of crazy, um, but what we will do to take care of you might differ. And like, I have a pretty good idea of who all my patients are and what they have, but not everybody will. So it's always nice when I answer the call and they say, oh, and I have this, because immediately I have a pretty good idea what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna start with. All right, let's talk about some language. So homocysteinuria and hyperhomocysteinemia. So homocysteinuria just means you have homocysteine in your urine. That's all it means. Usually it's a metabolic disease. Usually somebody has a block in an enzyme. On the other hand, hyperhomocysteinemia just means that you have an elevation of homocysteine in your blood. This doesn't always denote an inherited metabolic disorder. And you may say, why is that? Well, it's an acute phase reactant. Homocysteine goes up whenever your body's in stress. Folks with metabolic homocysteinurias, it'll go up higher and it won't be able to fall as well. But you can see elevations in blood in individuals right before they have a heart attack. You can see it elevated in blood in folks with rheumato rheumatologic disease. But you can also see it elevated in folks who are B12 or folate deficient. Um, and hyperhomocysteinemia, and I, I talk about this a little bit because I know you all know how to Google. I know you all know how to Google, right? And some, and I know you all Googled with the, when you got your diagnosis. Like, you'll say, no, no, I never looked anything up. I'm only gonna say, I know you did this. Your metabolist knows you Googled. We all know, it's a secret that we all, tell anyone, but you might have gotten incredibly confused when you looked it up, and that's okay. All right, so let's talk about this. So we, as metabolists, often use homocysteine, homocysteine, total homocysteine, 
all kind of sort of interchangeably, but they all actually mean something slightly different. Um, homocysteine is usually a single piece of this amino acid. Homocysteine is a dimer of this amino acid. And then we have protein bound homocysteine, which are like singles bound to protein. And when we talk about to total homocysteine, that's two E's, um, it's the blood component. So it's the protein bound, the little singles and the, and the doubles. Um, and this is only important if you're talking about these things in terms of a clinical trial. It's also slightly important if you're looking at the guidelines because some of the, most of the guidelines now say total homocysteine is what we follow. And that's because virtually every single hospital that has their own lab can look at that. Homocysteine and the dimer or the singleton homocysteine is incredibly harder to do, look at clinically. Um, and so most of the guidelines don't talk about that, but most of the original research was done using those. Okay, why could you have elevated homocysteines? I've already hinted at this, right? In, come on, why do we have it? You can cheat. <laughs> Help me, what does it say? It, you can have your inborn error metabolism like your inherited thing. That's what most of us in this room are here for, right? But folate deficiency, right? That means your folate is low. And folate is a vitamin we're supposed to eat in our diet. Um, incidentally, your homocysteines can't be controlled if your folates are low. How about B12 deficiency? What's the most common cause of B12 deficiency? Geriatric age, you can't bind it in your gut. These are the people that get their, their, their B12 shots every, every month, right? Most of our, we think of this as being our grandparents, all of those things, right? Okay, inflammation. So this is rheumatoid arthritis. This is psoriasis. These are any of the inflammatories. This is where it comes back being kind of a, uh, uh, a reactive species. And the nitrous oxide. Anyone know what the other name for nitrous oxide is? Yeah. Laughing gas, right? When do you get laughing gas? When you go to the dentist. Should, if you have an inherited metabolic disease with homocysteine, get laughing gas? No. no. Um, your dentists are not going to know this, so you may have to tell them. All right, categories of inborn errors in metabolism that have elevations in homocysteines. I want you to raise your hand when I say your category. So cystathione beta synthase, this is classic homocysteinuria. All right, okay. Uh, the remethylation uh, defects, this is how do, I, how do I make methionine from homocysteine? This is gonna be covolamine G, covolamine E, and, M, and severe MTHFR. All right, and then the covolamine processing defects. This is covolamine C, I know we have some C's. We know I, I, I can see the C's in the middle. Any more cobalamine C's in here? Is there anybody with cobalamine D? No, all right. Um, anyone with cobalamine J, X, H, F? I said G. G gets to be remethylation. Anybody? I don't see anybody, okay. Um, so you can see there's lots of these disorders and these are the three big categories. And I'm a metabolist, I'm sorry. This is my pathways, okay? Like you all kind of probably get a little ill when you see these pathways. Um, and so I put the pathways up here because these are the big categories that we're gonna see. We see the CBS deficiency and those are the folks that can't, that can't get homocysteine to make cystothionine, right? And then we have the, the methylcobolamines. Those are your cobolamine defect, processing defects. I know that uh, Jen Sloan's gonna talk about those at some point. And then, um, and then uh, the other, t the remethylation defects. So methionine synthase, which is cobolamine G and E, and severe MTHFR. And you can see all of a sudden when you look at this pathway why, these fo why you all have elevations in homocysteine, right? Right, kinda, maybe. Like, if you block, you accumulate downstream and you're deficient upstream. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. 
All right. So like this is this is going to this is the um, HCU Network America kind of thought of how do you think about inheritance pan panel patterns and genetics. Okay. So there's really two types of inheritance panels patterns that we're going to see in homocystinurias. You have the autosomal recessive. This is I've lost both copies, so my parents are obligate carriers. And then there's the X-linked, in which it's only on my X chromosome. And if I'm male and I have one X chromosome, I'm likely to have the disease. If I'm female, I get two Xs. And typically, I'm a little bit more protected, unless, of course, I'm unfortunate. And unfortunate, I turned off the, the typically functioning X chromosome. Right, and so this kind of takes us through these patterns in a slightly different way. And we're gonna go through this using my, using my, um, using my biochemical pathways. But this kind of gives you an idea, if you follow your particular line, where we get the therapies and where the differential and where the interactions are. And we'll talk a little bit about most of these things. So, what categories are included? Well, we talked about this a little bit. So that which is circled with the red, that would be our remethylation defects. Our yellow line, that's the cobalamin processing defects. And the big blue square, that's really CBS deficiency, okay? And I want everybody to kind of look where they are and think about, and this is where residents, fellows, doctors get confused. Is your methionine high with my disease or is my methionine low with my disease? Because my homocysteine is high. Okay? So when we think about all of these disorders, I think of damming a river. And that's why the pattern really makes sense, okay? I'm putting a dam in this river and that's my metabolic block. And I'm going to flood upstream and I'm going to be deficient downstream. And if I'm flooding upstream, what do I want to do with that flood water? get rid of it, right? I don't want to flood my crops. And how do I prevent having too much flood water upside that drain, that up, upstream that dam? I reduce that which is upstream, right? Now, if I'm deficient downstream, then I want to replace the water downstream, right? So, Dr. Corson did a great job. He got me all set up for this because he talked about catabolism and anabolism. So clearly, the water going down the dam is avoiding catabolism, right? Reversing catabolism, preventing, breaking up that which, I, that which accumulates upstream. And then we want to just decrease exposures. That's really like taking the flood water away. I want to scavenge the toxins. So if I'm going to flood water, I want to suck up the toxins. In homocystinurias, I want to decrease the homocysteine, right? And then I want to manufacture that I'm not that that which I'm not making. So when we're talking about disorders in which we have low methionine, we want to make sure our methionine goes up, right? Because that's what we really need. And then Many of these disorders have cofactors. So the cobalamin processing defects are the perfect example of cofactors. We're talking about B12. B12 has to get processed so that it can help other things work. All right? When we're talking about cystathione beta synthase, we're talking about pyridoxine, B6. That enzyme needs B6 to function. Now, not everybody with a CBS is B6 responsive, but it needs B6 responsive. If we're talking about the remethylation defects, we may be talking about folate. We may be talking about how do I get folate so that it can allow me to remethylate something, right? And finally, research is really, how do I poke holes into that dam? How do I fix the enzyme? How do I replace that dam? How, to, how do I figure out how do I make this disorder work better? And there's lots of sponsors out there that have ways to do that for many of these disorders. Now, what happened is they locked a bunch of us in a room about seven years ago. I mean that literally. They locked a bunch of us in a room about seven years ago. And we'll do this also for the remethylation and um, 
the Kaboli meat defects. So they locked us in this room and they said, what's the biggest issues and how do you take care of people who have CBS deficiency? How do you do the reverse catabolism, prevent the, prevent the stuff going in? How do you suck up this flood water? How do you replace that which is not manufactured? And honestly, this, a lot of these folks are European. Um, in Europe, you have to have data for anything that you said, okay? So there has to be studies. Now, in metabolism, is your disorder incredibly rare at your institution? How many of you guys know somebody else that has your disorder? And some of you do, some of your institutions are really big and you know other people. Some of you, the first time you've met somebody with another disorder is one of these meetings, right? And so putting together information about how you take care of patients with this, there's not a lot of clinical trials. We're gonna honor Harvey Mudd later today he has one of the biggest natural history studies that's ever been published. It was published in 1984. Okay. And, that, and, and so they basically locked us in a room. And they said, how are you going to take care of CBS deficiency? And so I highlighted this particular pathway. So I'm going to ask you guys, okay, so how do I... What am I going to do to prevent flood water with this pathway? If I block at CBS, what am I accumulating? I'm accumulating homocysteine and methionine. That's my flood water. What am I deficient in? The cystathione, right? Okay. So how am I going to, what am I going to do? Does it any, okay, Danae, what's the thing you hate most about having CBS? The diet. Now, why do you think you have the diet? Because you have to restrict protein because the more methionine you put into that, the more cutoff you have above. You're stuck in a box, right? Okay, if you're, if you're pyridoxine, you're poking holes in that and so you can kind of slide through. One of the ways we are decreasing the homocysteine, so we're trying to, fluck up, uh, we're trying to suck up the flood water is using the betaine. Okay, now we're kind of seeing where we're going with this therapy and that's kind of why we tell you what to do. The problem is CBS deficiency isn't the pathway. CBS deficiency is this, right? These are the things that happen to people that have CBS deficiency. You can have psychosis if you're not under good control. There's a lot of anxiety and depression individuals who are not treated in the first four years of life can have intellectual disability. We can see stroke-like episodes and have movement disorders. The ectopic lenses, that's the dislocated lenses, and severe myopathy can be completely complicating our lives. And often in some of our adult patients is the one trigger that got people into therapy. You can have unusually long limbs, everybody that I've looked at a DEXA has some level of osteopenia or osteoporosis, that's brittle bones. And you can also see bone deformities. And then the big scary one, you can have blood clots and you can have those blood clots in your brain, you can have those blood clots everywhere. Um, and that's the patient. And that is what you present as. And then I say, okay, how are we gonna treat it? And we've already talked about this a little bit. We talked about, okay, I'm stuck in this box diet goes into this box. So I've got to pay attention to diet because I want to keep my methionine down. <laughs> I'm going to use betaine. I like cold coals and cystathione beta synthase. And oh yeah, betaine doesn't work very well unless my folate and my B12 are replete. So we're reversing catabolism and avoiding catabolism. This is where you should not be fasting for adults no longer than 12 hours. This is making sure you have adequate calories. This is the methionine restricted diet, but you also need enough protein that you don't become catabolic for protein. This is why you and your, your uh, metabolic dietitians are good friends. Um, we're gonna scavenge the flood waters by using betaine. We're gonna add pyridoxine if you're responsive. And there are people that are incredibly responsive. And then you're going to replace that which is not made. And there's a question about whether cis adding cysteine to diet helps. 
there is no data to support that, but that would be that would be that particular one at this point. Any questions? I wanted to ask about betting because my daughter doesn't get it and should she? Like so her levels are okay now? If your levels are okay, then you probably don't necessarily need betting added. I think of it as, okay, so this is a great question to answer. This is a great question because the other thing you have to know about metabolic disease is there's a continuum. So people with the same disorder can be on this continuum. And you can have folks that are incredibly mild as in don't, basically barely have anything at all, all the way to people who are incredibly severe. And your therapies will also depend on where you're sitting within that continuum. So do I have patients in which all I give them is a sniff of pyridoxine and their homocysteines are totally normal? Absolutely. Do I have people that I'm doing everything under the sun to get their homocysteines lower? Absolutely. We, I, I have both ends of the spectrum and I have everything in between. And that becomes one of the challenges is because even people in the same family may be different places on the spectrum. Because every time I put a big list of things, not everybody has everything, usually. Sorry. She's uh, non-responsive <clears throat> to B6, but anyway, we... She's, she's getting it with diet. That's awesome. Yeah. She's in your blood. I don't know if it's Is she... Are you in Uruguay? It is not available in Uruguay. Sorry? It's not available currently in your country, probably. They could get it, but they... they don't have uh, how to measure finding. It takes like a month. Yep. Yeah, earlier this week we had a, a person from Chile and he was talking about how hard it is to get things into different places. So we, we actually had a conversation about betaine in Uruguay um, and betaine into Colombia because they can get it into Chile. All right, let's move on to the remethylation defects. And I think you guys are spread out a little bit all over, right? So the methylation defects. So methylation is incredibly important. It turns things on and turns things off in terms of transcription, translation. It helps regulate everything. And so having difficulty making methyl groups and methylating makes it very difficult. And this particular, this is our cobolamine G families, our cobolamine E families, and our severe MTHFRs. And what happens is, Methylation is essential to move homocysteine to methionine, okay? So individuals who have trouble with methylation have low methionine. So what's different in a remethylation defect from a CBS defect for methionine? Diet, right? In, in CBS, the diet is huge because you have to keep your methionines down. In remethylation defects, the challenge is you, your methionines are naturally low. You're trying to get them up. Why is that? Because methionine is a methyl donor to allow methylation of everything else in the body. Okay? And so the elevation in homocysteine, because you can't move homocysteine to methionine, and your methionine is incredibly low, your body's like, we need more homocysteine because our methionine's really low. We need to make more of this methyl stuff. Um, and so in these folks, for the, you guys' diet is a little bit different, right? It's a little bit less. And in fact, there's a set of guidelines for, uh, they actually put all the cobolamine related re and remethylation defects together in these guidelines because this is, a, these. The cobolamine C's, D's, E's, F's, G's, J's, and MTHFR's have more in common with what you do for therapy than the CBS patients do. Um, and it's all based on the diet issue, okay? And so we're gonna separate cobolamine, CDE, and MTHFR, G and E into 
two discussions. So what the remethylations, the, and as I said, this is severe MTH of R, cobalamin G, and cobalamin E. So homocysteine is still a problem, so you still get thromboemboli. And, you know, the thromboemboli lead to strokes. These individuals with cobalamin G, E, and MTHFR often present very similarly clinically. They can have cerebral uh, sinus thrombosis, especially in childhood and infancy. They can present with apnea, so stop breathing suddenly. Um, and depending on how severe their initial presentation is, they can have intellectual challenges and they can have autistic features. The big scary part here is the thromboses, right? It's the strokes. And this is what the patient looks like, not my, not my pattern. Um, also of important note, uh, you can actually get renal dysfunction with episodes. And so kidneys may not work particularly well during a decompensation. And it's important to remember this. Usually the renal dysfunction will almost normalize if it does not normalize completely. And as a group, there is decreased strength. These folks are not as strong. And it's probably the remethylation part, but we don't really know. There is a growing cohort through EHOD that was the European Network and Registry for Homocystinurias and, and Related Disorders. Um, but this, this, these disorders are incredibly rare, um, and there's very little data about what am I going to do and what therapies do we have to make things better. So we are using this model system to say, okay, what can I do? Right? What are the things I can do to make this better? And so in this case, you know, we're going to do what? We're going to make sure we get enough methionine in our diet, right? We're going to try to drop our homocysteine levels because those kind of correlate with thrombosis, with betaine. And then, like, if I've got a cobalamin G or cobalamin E, I'm probably going to get a little bit of extra B12, because I'm going to try to make those enzymes work better um, if there's enough enzyme to work. And if I have a MTHFR, I probably will give 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate or I will give folinic acid. These are disorders in which you should not give folate. But the general recommendations say, no diet, betaine. Plus or minus folinic acid folate, plus or minus hydroxycobalamin. And people are like, why can't they be more specific? Well, they're not more specific because uh, there's no data to tell you that the thing that we're doing is correct. And so I know I had a question earlier today about uh, um, methylfolate. The issue is that it's not been studied in this po population, but in theory, it should be better than folinic acid. All right. The, yeah. I just had a question about in general in the dress the dosing recommendation. Uh, you want the betaine dosing recommendation? We'll do, we'll just do the betaine dosing in general and then we can talk about G and E. Um so the clinical trials done to look for betaine and response to homocysteine only went up to between six and nine mil, uh, grams a day. Okay, so everybody take a deep breath. So that's what the clinical trial did, all right? Um, the evidence for how, to you, how you start someone on betaine comes out of Great Britain. And Great Britain has a large CBS, po a large CBS population, large, because, but a large CBS population because there is some founder effect variance within that population. And the recommendation of how you start someone is you start them weight-based. So you start somebody at 50 milligrams per kilo per day, and then you move them up to 100 milligrams per kilo per day. And it's generally thought that most people stop responding after about 200 milligrams per kilo per day. But it is, but you can go up to 250 milligrams per kilo per day. Now, this is where it gets complicated because let's say you've got someone 
that is, you know, 60 pounds. We're gonna say it's about 30 kilos because my math is easier that way. Well, 30 kilos times 200 puts us at six grams a day. And what do you do if you're more than 30 kilos, right? Um, and, and so it's interesting because some of our colleagues in the Middle East actually treat adults who have a CVS deficiency and others up to 24 grams per day. Yeah. And, and so, and so it seems like we're probably okay going bigger doses, but the studies were only six to nine and were not done in MTHFR cobalamin GRE in part because it's very rare. My clinical experience, so I'm going to take off my expert, my clinical experience is cobalamin G's, E's and MTHFR's need much higher dosing. The challenge though is, we're going to look back at this pathway, is let's say, um, let's say I give you a great big dose of betaine and I drop your homocysteines and I become methionine, what happens to that methionine? It rotates right back to homocysteine, okay? And so it's the balance between methionine to total homocysteine that you're really aiming for. So you want the, you want the methionine to be, at the, I like to hit it 24, 25. Some people try to get it into the total normal range for plasma amino acids and get the, and get the homocysteine as low as possible. But there isn't any data that that's the right way to do it. But that's generally but what most of us do it that do that. But that's, that's the dosing kind of picture. And, you know, I think, as I said, I think the MTHFR, cobalamin Gs and Es all need more higher doses, um, but we just don't have a lot of data to support what you do at that point. Who I'm wants sure. to go first? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you got the G family started now. Just yeah, so that's that. okay. It's just a question. So, butane metabolism in the liver passes through the intestinal tract, which is where the glands are supposed to be. Correct. So, my question for you is in your clinical experience with higher doses, because I think most of the days you're taking pretty high dose, um, we've all talked before, can that affect your lipid? So it's hard to say if it's related. And the reason I say that is because one of the disadvantages if you have one disturbed pathway is that you still have these two other pathways that have to balance. So I don't know if it's related to the betaine or if the fact that I can't methylate quite as well, that I've got this disturbed amino acid pathway requires my glycogen and my fat to change the way that I function to maintain energy, right? So that's something in metabolism we don't understand. We don't understand how do you balance having protein, fat, and carbohydrates if you disturb a particular pathway, okay? And so I can't tell you it's not betaine, but I also can't tell you it's not cobalamin G, right? And we could talk about designing studies to try to figure this out. We could, in theory, fi figure it out with an animal model, but the last time I checked, a mouse is not a human, <laughs> right? So, like, you have to be incredibly cautious when you take animal to human. So I think that's where you would start. You would start with an animal model, recognizing, and oh, yeah, um, mice is homocysteines are already three times that of humans or more. So, like, so I think that... Um, that that would be where you would start. But I think you have to remember that when you start in the animal model, it's just a model. And the trick is, how do I understand this in human physiology? 
Is that fair? Is that a fair question? I don't want to minimize the animal models, but like what we find in mice may not be as applicable in humans. And we've been doing physiology, we're going to say for 200 years, and there's so much we don't know about physiology. All right. So I don't know the answer to your question. All right. Any others? Okay. Okay, I have a thing letter. Uh real quick back to the data that in your exercise you talked about the fact that you can have the same So, um, I'm going to wear my it's incredibly practical hat, and then I'm going to wear my, 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 this is what. So, um, it should be dosed at least twice a day, about 12 hours apart. A lot of people find it more practical to do it with meals, right? So, like... I'm not sure we know that, like, I can tell you what the, the kinetics are supposed to be, but they were studied in CBS. Okay. So, it, so, and I know that we should probably be dosing at least twice a day. So we should divide that dose twice a day. A lot of people will do it three times a day because it, it's just more practical for them to try to group it, especially given see um everybody that takes bad betaine yes it's gritty yes it's slimy yes it smells bad yes you can smell like a fish <laughs> and the bigger your dose the more likely you are to smell like a fish and so like sometimes it's a little easier to get it in smaller doses than bigger doses <laughs> All right, let's talk about a little bit of the cobalamin processing defects. I know the NIH folks will talk all about this. I know that we're going to talk about the remethylation research projects. Um, so these are the things that lead to a combined disorder. This is the methylmalonic aciduria plus the homocystinuria predominantly. This is cobalamin C, cobalamin D1, cobalamin X, cobalamin J, and cobalamin F. Um, and this is the pathway. Uh, and this is the patient. So again, you can have intellectual challenges, you can have learning differences. In cobalamin C and D, you actually can have brain malformations and congenital heart. Um, this is unlike any of the other ones and can really be complications for life. The eye disease though, it, I think is the one thing that many of my patients think is the most challenging. So this is the retinopathy and macular, and macular disease. Um, Individuals who have a more late onset, so don't get picked up as neonates or young children, and have a late onset, actually can have peripheral neuropathy that can be paralyzing. Um, and those folks are presenting, if they're not picked up as newborn screens in their 16, 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s, with just this like foot drop, and are actually seen by the neurologist. Um, and this can truly progress to full peripheral neuropathy uh, with ventilation compromise and loss of, loss of um, ability to walk. And we're going to talk a lot about cobalamin C and D. And I'm sure I'm looking back there at, looking there at Jen. Are you going to talk about hydroxycobalamin? All right, because I was not going to talk about hydroxycholin. Irini, you're going to talk about it? I was not going to talk about it because I know these guys are here, um, and I know you all know these guys. Um, let's talk a second about cobalamin X. So this is a global transcription factor that controls regulation of a number of genes, including the transcription and then subsequently decreased translation of cobalamin C. Uh, individuals are treated like they have cobalamin C generally, but they have a very severe phenotype. 
And so understanding if you have cobalamin C versus cobalamin X is often an important thing with kind of outcomes. Um, and we treat it like cobalamin C, but we don't know if it makes any difference. So then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the differences because we've highlighted a little bit about this, but I suspect you all have figured out what some of the differences. What do you think the biggest difference between the remethylation defects and the cobalamin processing defects are? Diet, it's absolutely diet. Um, everybody uses betaine. The trade name is cystidane for those. Pyridoxine, sometimes you're responsive with CBS. You don't typically add pyridoxine for the remethylation of the cobalamin defects. Folinic acid or folic acid. CBS, so I dropped this, but if you didn't catch it the first time, you do not respond to your betaine if you're B12 or folate deficient. So in CBS, we often replace it because there's a folate sink and people use a lot more folate um, than the general population. So we'll do it if we're deficient or we're concerned about deficiency. Um, remethylation defects, we don't want to use folate, we want to use folinic acid. And the cobalamin processing defects, I put a maybe, because like, maybe? Um, there is probably a folate sink there as well, but there's not a lot of evidence that supports that. Hydroxycobalamin. Um, CBS, if you're deficient. Remethylation, I say some. So you may not have to do shots for cobalamin GE um, and, and THFR, but you need to have B12 if your folate's gonna work. So maybe, so some folks will replace it. And then the cobalamin processing defects, um, this has gotta be an IM, it's gotta be daily. It could be a sub-Q. There's some evidence and our folks from Colorado do the sub-Q form. Okay, so we just talked about why these things are different. And although everybody has homocystinuria, there's some differences in the way that I take care of them. And this is where we go back to where I started. When I said, please, 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 please tell people which defect you have. Now, ER docs aren't going to know the difference. Preferably, they don't for the cobalamin C's and D's and G's and E's. Be very careful that they don't code you as being B12 deficient, so cobalamin deficient, because that's a different ICD-10 code. Um, and uh, you can kind of see how things are different. So I'm going to do a second on research what is it and why do I care if I have one of these disorders, okay? So I know you all know why you care about research because at the beginning of the talk, I'm like, they locked us in a room and we argued over it because there wasn't a lot of data. So research is the way that we get the information that tells us how to take care of you better. And there's really kind of three types of research. The first type is natural history and registries. These are recording what happens when it happens. And these are the things that like you register. So rare X is one of them where you register and they do your medical records and they look at your labs. EHOT is another kind of natural history registry. Then there's clinical trials for drugs. And we'll, send, we'll spend a second on the next slide to talk about clinical trials for drugs. But remember, there are three, there's three phases. The first phase is, it, is this drug safe to give? The second phase is, could someone respond to this drug? And the third phase is, do they respond to this drug? Okay, so there's three phases of all of clinical trials for drugs. And people are needed in every single phase. Uh, for all the medications that get approved. And you can listen to everybody kind of complain a little bit about the FDA. Anything you can do to let the FDA know that certain parts of your disorders make your life more complicated. Diet, I want more protein. I, uh, hydroxycobalamin, we need, some, we need bigger doses of shots. Anything you can do to make people understand what your life is like at the FDA helps people design clinical trials that are applicable to you. Um, and then basic science. Basic science is what is this disorder? How does this dysfunction, ex 
how does this dysfunction impact other things? Why do they impact other things? And what does it impact? And this is part of the conversation we were having over here. The physiology isn't known. And so the basic science helps inform, oh, wait, if this impacts this, we might be able to find something here. And then this is where new drugs come from. And the reason that is, is the road to a new rare disease therapy starts with an eure eureka moment. That eureka moment may not be what you think it is. That eureka moment is me walking in and seeing a patient and looking and saying, huh, I see this. But that eureka moment may also come from some data scientists looking at the natural history study and saying, I see this. That eureka moment may be that basic science, poor little grad student who walks in with their stuff and says, Dr. Chapman, I'm observing this in this cell line from Coriel that has homocystinuria, and I don't, I don't understand it. And I look at it and say, it's gotta be wrong, repeat it. And they come back in and they say, it's the same thing. <laughs> Okay, that might be the Eureka moment. We may say that. And at that point, we say, okay, this is a target. This is a target or this is a molecule or this is something that allows me to screen for this particular thing. And then we do it in animals. This is the preclinical stuff. This is, these are the promising compounds and these are the biomarkers because I can tell this compound interacts here because I can measure this. And at that point, and we've now 13 years down the line, 14 years, 15 years down the line, say, oh, I can do a phase one, two, okay? And at that point, is this, is this safe? And what's the dose in humans? And finally, phase three, does it work? And at this point, we talk to the FDA and we say, and we've talked to the FDA from real early, like preclinical, and we're like, can you approve this? And hopefully, way back in the preclinical when we're designing the phase one, two, we got the FDA to approve that they're gonna take this particular marker because patients care about it, okay? But I want you to look at that timeline. That's almost 25 years, that's a generation. And unless we participate in trials, all kinds, whatever your comfort level is, we can't move drugs forward. Now the COVID vaccine has made this slide. Everybody's like, oh, but they did it in 18 months. And I'm like, but there were 20 years of experience before they even put, they designed the COVID vaccine. So like you telling me that's 18 months, it's 20 years. All right, so registries help advance treatment. So these are, this is from the EHOD registry. These are two of the big papers that came out of EHOD recently. Um, both, you can see one's in 2000, one's in 2022. Um, I suspect that second one makes a few of you happy. Um, and then this is why do I care? Well, so the FDA has to make sure the drug approved works and you, we need natural history and patients to tell the FDA what you care about. If it's a rare disease, I can't get very many patients. I only have a handful of patients to recruit. And there's all these different types of drugs. There's small molecule drugs and there's cofactor drugs and there's replacement drugs and there's enzyme replacement. There's nucleotide based drugs, there's gene therapy, there's RNA, there's lots of stuff. There's not very many patients and so I consider us really lucky these days because there's lots of things that are in the pipeline from many companies and know that like the challenge is how do you recruit? How, how do you make decisions? And at this point, I think we're good. So I've answered some of the questions along the way, but does anyone have any additional ones? So, so yes and no. <laughs> so the answer is 
yes, you can take too much. So betaine is a perfect example, right? So betaine, if you have CBS deficiency and take a really high dose of betaine, you basically cycle around in a circle. And if you don't take methionine out of that circle, your numbers are gonna be high together. It's not dangerous, but there's no exit, okay? Pyridoxine leads to peripheral neuropathy at higher doses. So B B6 has a dosing range and a specific dosing range. Um, because if you go over about a thousand milligrams a day, you're likely to develop peripheral neuropathy over a period of time because these are things we take for our entire life. So the answer is yes and yes and no, depending on what it is, depending what the underlying diagnosis is. Um, in general, the water solubles are safer, but pyridoxine is water soluble. Any other? Uh, you must have questions. You have the text for Maybe I can ask a comment because, okay, okay. Um, the monitoring of methionine in CBS patients, not every clinic does it. A lot of them are very focused on uh, homocysteine. So um, what are your recommendations on monitoring for methionine? I think it depends on the age, honestly, because somebody that's growing incredibly fast, so this would be an infant, right, who's growing incredibly fast, I have to look much more frequently because I need to make sure that the diet and the diet, we're going to diet, big question, big note versus little note, um, gets enough protein, but not too much protein. And that takes a lot. The other time that you need to really watch diet and balances is things like pregnancy, puberty. Okay. So in less than a year i want to see you every i might see you every few weeks but i want to see you like every month every two months to look at my methionine level because that's really helping me dose things make sure our diets are okay as folks stop stop growing fast we see a lot less variation around those particular doses um because we're seeing a lot less variation in terms of how much they're using but also how much, how, what they're eating, right? So like one of the things that my dietitians love and my dietitians hate is often folks who are on diets eat very similar things day to day to day to day, right? Because like, you know, it works. Well, for me, monitoring you become, just became incredibly easier because I don't expect to see a lot of variation across what your methionines are gonna be on that diet with that homocysteine. Um, I, the guidelines say at least every three year, three months in the little kids, six months and slightly older and a year in adults uh, for plasma amino acids. The other reason I look at plasma amino acids is I wanna make sure you're not deficient. I wanna make sure that your leucine and isoleucine and valine, if we're restricting the amount of protein and methionine you have, is, is lower. I grant that not everybody has access to prompt amino acids. It may take a week or two. Um, so, so, but that, that's kind of how frequently we look in our clinic and the guidelines say it varies a little bit. If I've got somebody with an MTHFR, or cobalamin G or E, um, again, we're looking very frequently younger. Almost every time in that cohort that I get a total homocysteine, I want the plasma amino acids because the total homocysteine doesn't tell me as much as the combination of methionine and, and homocysteine together in terms of dosing, are we in trouble, are we not in trouble? It, but there will be variation. Just everybody varies their amino acids kind of around me. Oh. I was gonna, oh. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Checking? Uh, I was going to ask about the betaine. The, you mentioned the 50 milligrams or 100 or 200. Our son is six and he's like 44 pounds and he gets four grams a day. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't do the math to know if that's high or low in that, on those scales. You were, you, so I got some more of a math is, problem, I guess. What's his homocysteine? Um, it's usually between like 50 and 100, I think. Cool. 
but like, but do other is that like a normal amount of betaine or do other kids have more than that or so we don't have a lot of good evidence of kids and betaine dosing we have how do you start it but at that point everybody's like oh look at the total homocysteine get the minimum amount that you can with enough methionine that's kind of the way the guidelines read so like if you're in that target range then then your dosing is probably okay he's 44 he's 20 kilos he's probably on just a second this shouldn't be this hard 200 uh 200 milligrams per kilo okay so Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so and you guys are probably on 20 gram, 15, 20. Yeah, the, so the, the, the G's, E's, and MTHFRs are almost always much higher than the, than the CBS's and the covolamine C's. Because sometimes the covolamine C's, all I have to do is give you big B12 doses, and I am totally in the I just had a question about the loop. Mm-hmm. When it shows the methionine becoming the um, homocysteine, the, the betaine takes the homocysteine and turns it back into methionine. Mm-hmm. Is, it, it, there must be some, is there some loss in the process? Is that why, like, in other words, if it were a closed loop where 100% of it was getting circulated, it would seem like it's not doing anything. But is it just that, like, you you turn some of the homocysteine into methionine and then it some of it doesn't get turned back? So remember, these are all amino acids. They have another job. They make protein. Okay. So, so like, that's the, that's the loss, if you would say. There's right. ways, there other are, ways for us to... There are places that yeah. those things go. Got it. The real question is, the methionine that goes into this pathway to go to homocysteine to come back, the vast majority of it, not all of it, so homocysteine, we want homocysteine because we want cystidine. You know, we want what's below there too. So cysteine, sulfates, glutathione, all that stuff. So let's say we're not, that's why we kind of keep going. But remember, we can pull methionine, that's the first amino acid in every protein. Okay. For all those, remember it from biology class. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I just wondered if, does it make sense to our son's on 25 grams of betaine a day? Um, he's a G. His homocysteine sits very high, like over 300. His methionine is low normal. Does it ever make sense to, or is it problematic? We supplement him with methionine, not with much, to really bump up his methionine. I mean, a lot to, to, I mean, could it, is it harmful to be, to, to have him have really high methionine? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. To, do, am I, I am I, I thinking I'm correctly? What, I'm following what you're asking. Okay. If you were to put him on a high protein diet to drive more methionine into the system, would that help? And I do not know the answer to the question. The biggest fear would be I'd push his homocysteine even higher. Right. Well, right. We, we've always been told low protein diet. So I'm here going. So um, low protein diet. So I'm, I'm going to. So there's the American diet, which mm-hmm. is six grams per kilo. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. And then there's low protein diets, mm-hmm. which is a little closer to the WHO RDI, which for adults is one gram per kilo per day. Ish. One to one point two grams per kilo. So oftentimes we'll talk about a low protein diet, but it's a low protein diet in relationship to the American diet. Um, I don't, I put people on a no meat, no flesh of animals, no poultry diet. You'll notice that I am being, um, in parts because I don't want them to go to Brazilian steakhouses. But like we we actually start adding protein back to a lot of these folks as they get 
older and are able to tolerate. So I don't put my Kabulami G's, E's, and MTHFR's on formula that's restricting things because I'm working hard to get that methionine to a normal level. Low normal. What about supplementing more? I know exactly what you're saying. Um, so there isn't any current evidence that that makes a difference, but there is also no current evidence that says that's damaging. And so that is not an uncommon thing for people to try. It's sort of like people also try cystine for homocystinuria. So it's not uncommon to see that occur in other places. Now, tiny doesn't taste so having people actually tolerate it is also the next issue. And I know Irene wants I just came up, Kim, because we will talk about diets and treatments a little later, and I think you're going to be in the different sessions. I don't want to yeah, like say that. something different and confuse people, but my only comment so that we discuss here with everyone, for the betaine dosing in the MTHFR GNEs, mm -hmm. we need to reach a very high dose, as you said, 20 grams or 10 grams, like very high doses. And for that, we need to spread it over the day for sure. Like twice a day, we'll not do it because 10 grams is an enormous amount of medicine to take, and it's really hard to take even in twice a day. It has to be three or four times a day because if it is one high dose at one time, it's not absorbed well. So it doesn't work if it will work much better if it's spread out in lower amounts during the day. So much more practical. And it's more practical. It's very hard, the amount of talking about grams in a medicine, it's like unheard of. Betaine is one of those things that we give gram amounts of. This is not heard for any other medicine. We're talking about milligrams, nanograms, like very, very small amounts. To give that much of a medicine is really, really hard. We have people make little capsules to make them in the tablets so that the kids can swallow several and three or four times a day to, to reach that amount of betaine. Uh, on a uh, daily, on a daily basis, so it is. It, it matters when you reach that high numbers. That's not now relevant for CBS because the CBS they have to lower. They have to make sure the methionine doesn't get very elevated. That can cause brain edema. So we make sure that the CBS is different than our methylation defect. But for our G and E families, you can be on a lot of betaine, especially when the kids grow older, in teenagers, twenties, when they're older, they need more betaine. And then it has to be spread during the day uh, to be absorbed better. Uh, and then there was something else. Uh, oh, you know, we are at, I, I'm sure we're actually over at this point. But thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. Um, Irene will be speaking here in a little bit um, after Brittany and I think Jen closes that session. So thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for. <laughs>